opera singers are people perceive them as being divas and all that kind of stuff, but they're the most supportive, wonderful people. Yes. Just so they love each other so much. And I do mostly actually choral music. Now I do a lot of early music also. So I'm sort of more niche in that. Um, and a lot of like church music and things like that, sort of more, um, you know, Palestrina Thomas, Thomas things, you know, Victoria, like these older composers. Um, and I sing with a group that is devoted to early music like that. But even still, singers, I think there's something about singing because that's what we're called to do by our creator. Like we're told to sing. We're singing is prank twice and all those little fra- little things about singing. So I do think there's like this like deeply spiritual connection that singers all have with each other, even if they're not Christian, even if they're not believers at all, that there is this grace that singers get from sharing with each other and singing together. And so that world is, I think it's a beautiful world. And I, you know, I'm very appreciative of all my, my singing buddies, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. I think, you know, I'm a little different because I'm, I'm pretty darn Catholic and, you know, there most, I would say a lot of the, in the artist world, there is, a, there aren't a lot of religious people, um, but they don't care if you are, you know, it's not like they're judging you or anything like that. So anyway, yeah. But that's yeah, yeah. the opera world is. We could talk about that more. It's it's a fun it's a fun place. Opera is yeah. really fun. I do think it's like it was funny when I first was diagnosed with breast cancer. A friend of mine was also diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer, and he oh, it's just a sad situation. But he passed away a couple months ago. But he said to me, he was like, "We have to sing Germain and Violetta." And I don't if your audience doesn't know, Germain was this. Um, he's a, he's a father character in an opera who his son is in love with a paramour and he breaks them up because it's, you know, very unbecoming of a, of a elite Parisian boy to be (laughs) in love with a prostitute essentially. And so Violetta though, in the meantime is dying of tuberculosis or dying of something. She's coughing all the time and she dies. And it's the most tragic opera ever because this father insists that they break up and then the boy finds out and he comes back and the father is filled with remorse because he's the one that caused this you know this breakup and she's dying at the end and they sing this beautiful duet and so he said to me he was like can we record Violetta and Germain and I was like no I feel bad about that I should have just done it but I'm like I am not touching Violetta like the most tragic um no it's too tragic i'm not doing it i'm not doing violetta i'm not doing mimi or any of the any of the tragic dead heroines in opera yeah. so anyway it's just a little aside i can, I, I can I, link the the scenes in traviata that will make your audience cry i became a fan of opera with the godfather the whole trilogy godfather one two and three there's quite a bit of opera in those movies mm-hmm. and of course i bought the soundtracks to them and I listened to them and people say, you listen to movie soundtracks? I said, yeah, I do. It was quite fascinating, but phenomenal, phenomenal music. And of course they use opera music to highlight, you know, the mafia killing people and yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think opera is often associated with sociopathy in movies, which is interesting to me. Anthony Hopkins in yes. Hannibal. Yes. Okay. He is always listening to opera. And, you know, I think yeah. that we associate it with this, like, people that are, have, like, a lack of access to their emotions in some way. And that's the only way that they can come out. But, um, yeah, opera is, I mean, it touches you in a way that nothing else does, I think, emotionally. Like, you know, and these stories are so timeless. And, I, you know, I watch any, like, especially, I think, Wagner operas. Like, those like the hero's journey and these kind of character led operas are so profound and they never, they never get old. Like you can always relate to them or, or, you know, even Mozart operas and stuff. It's just, you you can, you can always relate to these characters and what they're going through, even if it's just completely absurd and over the top, which a lot of them are like, they're just absurd. Uh, But you know, that never dies. And I, I like to think it's because opera was largely written before we had a concept of psychology. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It just was. It just was human. It just was the state of man. And we didn't psychoanalyze people. So we, um, I think that the older playwrights and those people were better, ac- they had better access to the soul and like what people actually go through without that kind of veneer of, um, you know, what, what's really going on scientifically. I don't know. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, 
Jenny, you're a lot of fun. Your husband is blessed. And let's do this again. And there's as as you as you evolve in your thinking about mortality, I want to know about it. I want to know how how this has evolved for you and how it has affected your family. And 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 not to not to take privacy away from from your family, but I think the the journey that you're on is going to be helpful for a lot of people. Like you've given hope to people already in this talk already. I mean, just the fact that you said, you know, that you don't consider your, like initially in the beginning of this talk, when we talked about panic, you said something about, you know, I'm going to be dead in a couple of months. And then it evolved to, I don't consider myself to be a terminal patient, terminal cancer patient anymore. So just even the evolution of your language in our talk has been incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting, I mean, the thing is, you know, it's everybody's terminal. So you, you pray your Hail Mary and it's, you're praying for now. You're praying for grace for now and the hour of your death. And those are the only two things that are certain in this world, right? Now yeah. and the hour of your death. Yeah. And so that's the, I feel like those are kind of the only two things we should ever think about is like, what can I do now to prepare for the hour of my death? Um, but beyond that, contemplating the amount of time we have. I think it's like Psalm 39. Is it Psalm 39 where you know, they say, Lord, let me know mine end. We don't, we're not given that. We're not yeah. given that. And so we just have to be humble enough to recognize that and try not to speculate because it'll make us crazy. <laughs> well, we, ha we have to trust the one who has numbered our days. And our days were known to God before we even existed. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a beautiful thing. And it's hard to relinquish the... It, it's hard to live with uncertainty because we don't know. You know, like you said, we're all terminal. You just don't know. I could have a massive heart attack in the middle of the night and never wake up. I mean, that can happen to any of us. So I think there's a weird arrogance with people when, you know, like I, I'm, I say often I'm going to live to 105. I just, I pick that number. I said, I'm going to live to 105. But I've kind of dialed back on that a little bit, and I'm like, your will be done, Lord. That's kind of like my attitude. I'll do the best I can. I'm not going to abuse my body. I'm not going to do anything to hurry up that process. I'm not going to, you know, and I'm not going to do anything to threaten my existence. But I'm more uh, resting in the Lord now because of yeah. that. I'm resting. Yeah. Well, and I think you just have to accept that whatever is willed for you is for your benefit. So you should never be afraid of the will of God. You know, the only thing we should fear is not cooperating with his will, but you should never fear his will. Right. You know, so you should fear him. You should fear your judgment. Right. But right. he's not going to do anything to hurt you spiritually if you cooperate. So easier said than done. <laughs> yes. And on that note, let's continue again with part two. Uh, we'll figure out when we're going to do it and stay in touch with me. I'll stay in touch with you. Jenny Hayworth, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was so good to talk.